Um, what I'm going to try and do for you is just give you a big global picture of maybe I think the, the single greatest challenge that we're facing in terms of our global politics right now. Um, into which, if I'm correct, every single debate and issue and struggle we have uh, fits into. Um, and then throw it open for questions. Uh, I should say just a couple of things I'm about because I get to travel to an awful lot of countries around the world. Um, we, are, we are a group that seeks to uh, promote peace and understanding, um, to help answer questions about the Christian faith. Uh, it's not our position to get involved in politics. I spend most of my life trying to avoid getting involved into any of the internal politics of any country I visit. Um, that's simply because we're guests in so many places, it's not for us to, to do that, but we, we do try and listen everywhere we go. Um, uh, let me give you a, a sort of a narrative backdrop to help explain what I'll be talking about. About five years ago, um, I began to notice something happening in, in the UK and in the US. At that point, I thought we were looking at an Anglo-Saxon problem. Uh, everybody was angry, everybody was bitter, um, there was a lot of upset, and people seemed to lose the capacity to disagree well with each other anymore. And the hallmark of all great civilization is not how we handle agreement, it's how we handle disagreement well. And it seemed we were losing the capacity to handle disagreement well. Everybody felt that if someone disagreed with them, the other party hated them. So all disagreement was received and interpreted as hatred. Well, um, a couple of months after that, I was speaking in Asia at a conference um, with 17 um, leaders uh, from different political leaders from different parts of Asia, and then a group of about 50 businessmen, all of whom were either family owners or CEOs of multi-billion dollar businesses. And while I was speaking to them, I gave an illustration about what was happening in the UK and the US, and then I got invited by the government of every single country that was represented at that conference to come and speak to them about why their own countries were so divided. So I can remember thinking, wow, okay, this is maybe a, somehow sort of a UK, US, Asian issue. Um, a few months after that, I was back in Oxford meeting with one of the university's largest single donors who's actually an African businessman. We were meant to meet for half an hour. We started at 8 o'clock for breakfast. We finished at 1 p.m. for lunch. And at the end, he said, I've just taken Tony Blair and um, a few other political leaders on a tour across Africa, I'd like to take you. What you're talking about is the most fundamental thing that's affecting Africa right now as a continent. Then from there I went to the Middle East where it was the same, and at this point I found myself asking the question, how can it be that across Europe, Africa, Middle East, Asia, North America, I just got back from Lima, Peru four weeks ago, and South America, how is it that on every continent of the world, we're all wrestling with the same basic struggle? Because we don't have any common history. Does that make sense in the terms of intellectual history, thought history? How did we all end up in the same place at the same time? And so this is something I've stumbled into. It's not something I just figured out. Um, it's, it's just something which, as I shared in different places, you could simply just see the response. When I spoke to the European Parliament about this issue four years ago, um, uh, I felt uh, I was giving praise that I didn't deserve. Everybody felt I was much more intelligent than I was because their, their, their conclusion was I'd spent so much time researching France, Germany, Italy, Spain, every member state of the EU, that I was some kind of genius who was able to figure out what was common across all of them. But that's not what happened at all. It was just an observation from 50,000 square feet. So what am I talking about? Well, I'm going to be talking to you about something using a word I really do not like, and I'll explain why I do not like it but it's increasingly being referred to as global victim culture. Now, if you were at the meeting last night, you would have heard me quote from the book of Amos in chapter six, where it says, you have turned justice into bitterness, so all your righteousness tastes like poison fruit. What the prophet is saying is if the quest for justice becomes bitter, even if you get what is right, it tastes like poison to everybody else. And the cries for justice in our world right now are very bitter. And we're facing this global phenomenon. And this is what um, uh, His Excellency Solomon said so eloquently and so well just now in his opening remarks. But it's not just the fact that it's a global problem. Our global heroes are now also victims. In most cultures of the world, classically speaking, 
whether you're looking at Middle Eastern culture, African culture, Chinese culture, European culture, it doesn't matter. The heroes of our culture were very often people who had suffered greatly, who had been through hardship, who had overcome, and somehow now were a uniting force in their people, in their country, and to create a hopeful future. We liked people who were able to overcome the circumstances into which they were born. But now, all of our superheroes, they're not like that anymore. I don't know if any of you have seen the original Superman movie, 1986, Christopher Reeves. Now, if you've seen that movie, you'll, re you'll remember, if you think what were his weaknesses, that he had none. Apart from kryptonite, Superman had no weaknesses. Rationally, perfect. Morally, perfect. Ethically, perfect. Kind, considerate, generous, understanding, handsome. He reminds me of me every time I think of him. <laughs> That's why he was a superhero. He was perfect. But have you seen Man of Steel, the 2011 millennial remake? How does that movie start? Superman is lost on a boat in a fog, struggling with his sense of identity, struggling with his sense of worth, emotionally unable to cope with the weight of expectation put on his shoulders. He feels cosmically lonely, cosmically abandoned, hurt, isolated. Superman, the modern day Superman, is a victim. I don't know if any of you have to watch Marvel superhero movies, but every Marvel superhero have all been used, abused, betrayed, abandoned. They are all victims. We're living at a time right now where all of our heroes have not been able to overcome the tragedies in their past. They're defined by them. And this is what we mean when we talk of global victim culture. Now, at this point, I need to make a distinction between a legal term and a psychological term. Now, my own background, a bit like um, Abdul Murray, um, is in law. So I studied law. I used to teach law. Um, I used to teach jurisprudence, which is the moral theory of law. When in law we talk about a victim, what we mean is there was a perpetrator of a crime and then the person who suffered that crime. Okay? Perpetrator, victim. In order to restore justice, you have to fight for the right of the victim. When justice collapses in a society, hope collapses with it. So it's always very important, therefore, to figure out how do we do what is right. And that is a very healthy dialogue. But then there is a very unhealthy side to it, which is psychological, not legal. And it's the psychological word, victim culture, which was developed by social psychologists in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, that we're talking about now, and it is fundamentally unhealthy. Let me try to give one illustration. Why is it that classically, if someone has been raped, you would train them to say, I am not a victim. I am not a victim. What are you training them to do? You are not training them to deny the past. That is not healthy for them or for anybody else. You are not training them to say it doesn't matter. That is not healthy for them or anyone else. Here's what you are doing. You are trying to say to that person, this event shouldn't define you. You are more than this. You are more precious than this. You are more valuable than this. If you allow this terrible thing that happened to you to define you, the person who did this to you in the past also has control of your present and they will also determine your future as well. In other words, you will become a prisoner to hate. And so you now need them to reject that victim mentality, not to be defined by that historical trauma. Otherwise, they continue to suffer the ongoing consequences for something which was never their fault. Now, it's when we talk about victim culture psychologically that we're dealing with something very difficult and very dangerous. And that's why Amos talks about not turn, making justice bitter. When we've been wronged, let me try to give a day-to-day a, a -day example that is to try to connect the dots. I'm sure all of you have seen friends who are close to you divorce. Now, let's suppose it's a very messy divorce. And you're friends with both the husband and the wife. And when you talk to the husband, you conclude that somehow he, married to ma ma he managed somehow to marry the Witch of Endor. When you talk to her, you conclude that somehow she managed to marry the Spawn of Satan. Now, here's the thing. When you sit with them, and they are telling you of all the terrible things that which have happened, what does that person want you to do? Go on. You said it. Take, Take their side. And taking their side means what in relationship to the other party? To hate them. If you don't hate the other party in the same way they hate it, they will say, I thought you were my friend. I thought you cared. How can this not bother you? How can you not understand it? 
And this is what happens, and you will understand this given the nature of your calling even better than me, when two sides are locked in dispute. It's not enough that you agree with party A, they also want you to hate party B. That's how you signal your view of virtue. That's how you <coughs> signal your agreement, by hating the person they also hate. And if you say to them, do you think the marriage collapsed because you were so busy you never talked to them, then they will accuse you of betraying them. Uh -huh. Now, this is where the psychology then becomes very ineffective, uh, very important, and very dangerous, because you can't communicate. But it's not just about personal communication. I'll give you one historical example, and then we'll just look at the global thing speeding this. In the early 1400s, there was a series of running battles around the city of Kosovo. I am not going to unpack all of that history. Some of you around this table may know enough about that region to know how dangerous that would be. <laughs> but during those running battles, uh, the Prince of Kosovo, a man by the name of Prince Lazar, was killed. Now, one side claims that he was killed on the battlefield. The other side claims he was no stabbed in the back in prison. That is, for the sake of this illustration, this is not important. He died. The people of Kosovo wanted him buried in their city. But because of the advancing army coming against them, they moved the body outside of town. Okay? And they mourned the death, the death of Prince Lazar. School children were taught songs about him. On the year of his death, the anniversary is marked. The nation defined itself as a nation in mourning, mourning the death of Prince Lazar. And that continued for hundreds of years. As the 500th anniversary of the death of Prince Lazar approached, the Kosovans asked the then Austro-Hungarian emperor to return the body to the city so he could be buried there. The Austro-Hungarian emperor refused. And so on the 500th anniversary of the death of Prince Lazar, a young Kosovan man set off to avenge himself against this historical injustice and assassinated the emperor's nephew, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and started the First World War. These historical traumatic events, when allowed to define us individually or as nations, provide a powder keg which can literally bring the whole world to its knees. As the 600th anniversary of the death of Prince Lazar approached, the then new leader of that area, Slobodan Milosevic, promised the people if it was the last thing he did, he would have the body of the prince returned to Kosovo and they would bury him. While the body was returned, everybody came up to mourn, a massive statue was erected, and on the 600th anniversary of the death of Prince Lazar, the genocide began. Victim culture, when we allow ourselves to be defined by the traumatic events of the past, has the capacity not just of destroying us personally because of bitterness in our own hearts, or destroying families, or even a nation. It can actually bring the whole world to its knees. And that's what we're talking about right now. Now, historically, victim cultures always end up in civil war or in war with their neighbors, without fail. So the fact that almost every country in the world right now is trying to define itself as a victim is of exceptional concern. In the victim narrative, if I'm the victim, here's how it works. Everything I say is motivated by love. But anything you say, if you disagree with me, is only explicable through hatred. Which means that all forms of disagreement and dissent become impossible. Because you are now part of a hate group. Now this is affecting the West as much as it's affecting the East, as much as it's affecting the Northern Hemisphere, as much as it's affecting the South. We are constantly moving to denounce ourselves in this way. Now it causes various problems. Now various people have written some books on this, but there's a problem with most of the analysis that I've read. The analysis tends to make sense only within one particular country. So in England, you can explain victim culture through class wars. Okay, when I was in South Africa, speaking to political leaders there, we can explain it through colonialism. Okay, if you're in Asia, depending which part of Asia you're in, you can explain it through various other factors. However, if any of these narratives were completely correct, they should explain why we're all in the same place at the same time. But we don't all have those same historical narratives. As important as those narratives are, how can we all be in the same place at the same time if we've had such different histories? What's converged us? Let me suggest just a couple of things, just to think about. Number one, the history of every nation is one of conquest, 
marriage, intermarriage, I mean, you name it. That's the history of every single country on the face of the planet. Now, most of us, our trouble is we can't deal with our history. We can't deal with the past. When there's a strong enough vision and sense of hope, people look to the future and everyone in the nation can pull together to get it. But when we feel that there is no hope moving forward, everybody's looking over their shoulder wondering who to blame. And right now, in most countries around the world, people are looking over their shoulder saying, who do we blame for this mess? And that's when the recriminations begin. Secondly, in the past, to create a victim culture, you needed the microphone. So if you read all of Adolf Hitler's speeches in 1936, 1937, that's exactly what he did in Germany. All of our neighbors hate us. The elites in your country are exploiting you. Nobody really understands you. So he says, you are the victim, and now I can now come as the hero to rescue you. It was very powerful. But in this day and age, everybody with a cell phone has a microphone in the country. And so we're now what we're doing is we're trying to get people to listen to our story, which is why we have what's called competitive victimhood. Now, please forgive me. I have half of my family is from the Middle East. But most of you will relate to this. How does competitive victimhood work? Of course I hate you. Last, yesterday, one of you threw stones at our children. Well, yes, that's because last week one of your shoulders, shol sol soldiers shot one of our kids. Yes, but last month, hey, one of your guys drove a bus into a school. Yes, but one year ago, one of your guys put a bomb in a shopping mall. Yes, but 10 years ago, one of your guys did this. Yes, but 100 years ago, your army did that. Yes, 1,000 years ago. And now we're all outbidding each other to see who's got the biggest competitive narrative, uh, competitive victim narrative to win everybody else's. I, I was in North America recently, and someone was saying to me, Michael, Look, you have to understand how, how we think, because we have 300 years of this victim narrative. And I smiled. This is one, one advantage that helps to have a mother who's from Cyprus. I said, well, in our country, we've got 3,000 years of victim narrative. We've been conquered by the Assyrians, the Arabians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Medans. I said, you name it. Mark Antony gave it as a love gift to Cleopatra. I mean, imagine giving the whole country away as a love gift. I mean, what's wrong with diamonds? But he gave the whole country away. I said, as a matter of fact, it's the last divided capital city on the earth. In our, on earth, we have a 3,000-year victim narrative, and now he went very quiet. Because my 3,000-year victim narrative makes me a bigger victim than his 300-year one. So now I have the ascendancy. Is that really the way we're going to settle our historical grievances and disputes? I mean, it's a crazy way of doing it, but that's exactly what's happening right now. We're all in competition to see who's been hurt the most. Now... This is where I find what Jesus Christ said in response to this to be fascinating. He told a very deceptively simple story, the parable of the Good Samaritan. <laughs> that story is about tribe, race, religion, language, geography, all of the things which we as victims on a national scale latch onto in order to justify our hatred of the other. A man fell amongst thieves, Jesus said, and he was stripped of his clothes and left unconscious by the side of the road. Now he's telling this story in answer to the question, who is my neighbor? A question Jesus Christ refuses to answer. He refuses to answer. Hmm. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells this story. Now what's the problem? Well, you will all understand this. Right now we're in this room, we're all dressed in Western dress, and I, woke up and I was on the phone up until the moment I walked in this room and even forgot to put my tie on. But for most of you, if I were to come, to wherever country you are from, I don't need to ask people really where they're from. I can look at their clothes and it will tell me if they're from the north, from the south, whether they're rich, whether they're poor. From the moment I entered this room, you looked at my shoes, my jacket, my watch, my haircut, and my glasses to figure out what kind of background I have. Which is why when you strip all of those things away, you can't tell. And the guy is also unconscious. Unconscious. We listen to accent. Abdul Murray made this remark himself as he introduced me. In every country you're from, when you open your mouth, people listen to your accent. And they assume how well educated are you? How well connected are you? How powerful might you be? So Jesus now creates a, a scenario in answer to the question, who is my neighbor? Who am I obliged to help? And he creates a moral situation in which you can't tell from the person's clothes, what tribe they're part of, nor from their mouth, because they're unconscious. And they're lying face down in the road. So Jesus says, so when a priest came by, 
should he help or not? Now, it's a fascinating moral dilemma, and there's no easy answer to that question. That road runs through the middle of nowhere. When I was um, in Nigeria recently, I illustrated it by saying, I said, I've just come from Jos to Abuja. We drove down one of three roads. The one we went down was a shorter road, but very dangerous. I said, imagine your son or daughter was driving down that road, and they rang you, and they said, Mama, Papa, I've just seen someone naked, lying face down on the road, unconscious. Shall I stop the car, get out, and help? So I said mm -hmm. to the leaders in the room, what would you say to them? <laughs> and they all spoke out loud. It was going out on live national TV. It was being broadcast to the nation. So I don't know if the people on the TV sets heard the answer. They all went, no, keep going. Hey, don't stop. When Jesus said the priest passed by on the other side of the road, nobody would have passed condemnation. Because that road runs through bandit territory. And to stop is to die. So when the next guy comes and passes by, same problem. And then Jesus takes a Samaritan, the sworn en enemy of the Jews, and the Samaritan stops. The Samaritan treats the guy by the side of the road. The Samaritan puts him on his horse, and the Samaritan takes him to an inn. And then the Samaritan says to the innkeeper, here are two gold coins, and when I come back in two weeks' time, if there's any money owing, I'll pay more. And this story is used to illustrate the fact by many Western thinkers that we should help the poor and we should give to, to mission that helps the poorest of the poor. But that's not the main part of that story at all. Every settlement on that road is Jewish. So if the Samaritan stopped to help a Samaritan, there is no way he takes him to a Jewish town. So the Samaritan has helped the Jew. So now the next question comes. When the Samaritan walks into the inn of this town and into a Jewish settlement, and this, we can put it in modern day thing, I, I, I have no problem with it. And you're an Arab. And you say to them, this is one of yours. And clearly someone of <coughs> your people did this to them. And you say, I would like to pay to look after them. And you turn to leave. Well, as Jesus was telling the story, he said, so the guy handed over the coins and said, I'll come back. And then the story stops. Now, do you ever watch those movies where you get to the end, you're about to find the end, and then, it, then the credits just start rolling up? What do you want to know? You're sitting there going, I don't believe it. These crazy producers, they want my money. They're not even going to tell me the end of this movie I paid for. I'm going to have to pay to see the second movie to find the end to the first movie. Well, that's what this story's like. The guy turns to leave. What's the question you want to know? Well, the question is, does he get out alive? And we don't know. It could cost the Samaritan their life to help this guy. And that's the challenge of that story. Jesus asked the question, who was neighborly to this other person? Now, we live in a world where we constantly want to ask, who are we obliged to? Who are our neighbors? Jesus is talking about something much bigger. Who acted in a neighborly way? Who treated the people around them as if they were their neighbors, regardless of how we think about it? Now, right now, in the bitter context that we're in, we have a huge problem. When justice becomes bitter, even if you get justice, the bitterness remains. Which is why even Hollywood used to know this. Every time you watched a revenge movie and the person finally killed the bad person multiple times, they would always have a sidekick. The sidekick would always ask them the same question. Are you at peace now? And the person would always give the same answer. It's not enough. I, I thought this would settle it for me. It's not enough. Revenge is never enough to bring that kind of peace. There has to be something different. Is there a different way of doing this? Now, here's my fear. Because we seem to live in such an emotionally and spiritually illiterate global culture at times, when we don't understand that bitterness is driving so much of the agenda, we're not responding correctly. Because when someone's bitter with you, the first thing you need to do is deal with the bitterness before they can hear what you're saying. It's like... I don't know if you've ever offended somebody, they really hate you. I'm sure you're all such a lovely person, nobody has ever taken exception to you. Nobody has ever treated you with contempt for no reason. Here's the hard thing, so long as they hate you, even when you try to do something nice for them, what happens? They still interpret it as some kind of attack. Okay? I can't believe this person sent me chocolates at Christmas. 
The last time I made these, they were making fun because they thought I was fat. And now they're sending me chocolates to humiliate me even more. Even when you try to do something which is kind, it will be received with pain. It's not going to overcome the problem that's actually there. Now, there are a couple of other things that we can look at in terms of the Q&A. Um, but now there is this huge issue about how to help people who are processing complex political problems. So I, I don't know the politics of all of your countries, but you take any big political dispute right now and play it through the victim narrative. Does it help make more sense of why everything's so much more complicated right now than it used to be? Now, it's not without hope. The last time I spoke on this issue to a group of political leaders, they said, can you give, me, can you give us any historical examples where bitterness has been overcome? I said, let me give you three. First of all, England and America. England and America should hate each other. England was the colonial foreign occupying power, the American people who forcibly <coughs> rose up in arms and threw them out. And yet, they've enjoyed a special relationship for a couple of hundred years. Why? More recently, Germany and Israel, two countries who should hate each other with a passion, but they don't. Why? I was so uh, delighted to meet um, His Excellency um, from uh, <coughs> uh, Rwanda, uh, who was here. You would think that, uh, not Rwanda, uh, uh, yes, Rwanda, you would think that given what had happened in the last 20 years, that that place would be a mess right now. And yet, in terms of where it is economically and everywhere else, it's remarkable. Why? Well, one of the things that's common in all of these three situations is the influence of the gospel. The challenge of the Christian gospel is it commands inside. Now, to forgive doesn't mean that you stop pursuing justice. That's not what it means at all. But to forgive means you let go of the bitterness and the hatred and the anger within. So that when you respond, you're not responding to <coughs> The hardest thing of being a diplomat, you know, is when someone says something to make you angry and you respond out of that anger. And as soon as you respond angrily, what do you wish you had done? Hmm. You would love, you would pay a million dollars to buy back five seconds of time to undo what you just said. Yeah. It never contributes well to the situation. The question is, how do we learn to forgive in that kind of way, <coughs> to let go of the root of bitterness so it doesn't control our actions? Once that has happened, then the way we respond externally to everybody else is very different. Yeah. And you can start to become a peacemaker in this world. Um, there is such a need to bring peace not through the force, some kind of external force. This is the sad thing now about where we are in terms of our international global diplomacy. So much effort to try to force things from without, and so little time to actually build relationship and win people from within. Jesus Christ was advocating and talking about the fact that he himself would ultimately pay the ultimate price to bring about a form of forgiveness. But in the parable of the Good Samaritan, he's saying there is a need for people to be willing to walk right into some of the most dangerous situations, with nothing but love and concern, even for people who may traditionally be considered to be their enemies. As a way of beginning to try to effect a change of heart, it's the only way it happens. It never happens when someone's pointing a gun at your head. Even if you comply, the heart still hasn't changed. Well, you've listened uh, very well. Um, I'll rattle off five other things I think have fed the global thing, and then we'll go into Q&A. One, the global financial crisis around the world has made most middle class families in every major city of the world feel excluded from their political future. If you're middle class and you live in any major city, the thing that keeps you awake at night is trying to answer the question, how will my children, even if they get good jobs, ever be able to afford to buy their own home? If you feel you have no economic future in your own political economy, and the middle class are excluded in that kind of way, as well as the working class, you will get a revolution every single time. And I'm sure none of you come from cities, you know, I'm sure in every city that you're from in your country, homes are eminently affordable and nobody has a problem buying anything. Mm. And all I can say is in Oxford, even if you got the highest paying job in the city of Oxford, which would be to be head of the research hospital, you still wouldn't be able to afford to buy a one bedroom apartment, let alone a small family home. So they feel there's no future in their own political economy. That's number one. Number two, the global financial crisis. Uh, all that did, um, uh, I don't want to go into too much of the economics here, but
but the trillions of dollars that were printed to bail out the global economy, you have to ask yourself, where did it go? Now, it didn't go into my bank account. If it went into your bank account, I'd like to meet you, you're my friend. Uh, we need to talk about something important. But it's caused a huge dislocation, and then there's this underlying sense of injustice behind the world that most people live with the reality of every day, which is why you see so many protests in parts of the Western world right now. Thirdly, the more pain we've been through and the more grievance we have, the more status we have. That's how it will happen when you're a superhero, which is why everybody with a Twitter account, what they want to do is exaggerate about the amount of pain that they're suffering. Because the more injustice I've had, the weaker your position. And so the more I can get and complain about you, well, think about it in your country. What old story told in your country talks about the great king who became a great king by constantly complaining about everybody else and all the pain they were in? It's a very strange situation to be in, but that's our global world. So the media has now, technology has taken on a huge thing. I want to mention one other, objectification. Um, the use of pornography has become a global phenomenon right now. The problem with it is it makes us treat other people as an object. So let me um, finish with this and I'll make one, one, one last thing and then we'll have some questions. If you were to say to me, Michael, um, what's it like working with this organization? You've been working with this guy, Rabbi Zacharias, for 23 years. What's it like? And I want to say to you, you know what? He's been using me all of this time. If that's my response, he's been using me. <clears throat> you understand I've said something very seriously wrong. Because none of us like to be used. And when we realize we've been used, we feel angry. The relationship between you and an object is one of consumption. Right? You consume it to meet a need that you have. The relationship between you and a person is one of connection. It makes sense? One person to another. That's the difference between the relationship between objects and the relationship between people. Our world has now so objectified other people, we use them. We connect with them to meet a need that we have. That's what happens with pornography and prostitution. That makes sense? We reduce someone to an object, they exist to meet a need that we have. Well, at that point, we lose relationship. And we live in a world right now where this has become so common. We actually talk about this, use each other. We talk about human resources. We don't talk about personnel anymore. Humans are a resource to be used. We have lost that contact with people. I, um, I feel, I'm so glad I'm not involved in politics. I feel sorry every time I read a story, and it's one of the things that does make me feel both sad and angry. Some political leader will be asked the question, when you meet so-and-so, will you shake their hand? I'm sure none of you have had to live through this particular nightmare. Okay? Will the cameras be there, will you shake their hand? The idea is if I come and shake your hands and we're enemies, well, that means because I'm being kind to you, that means I affirm you, I agree with you. But that's not what that means. I sometimes get to meet some very militant leaders around the world. And I normally start by holding their hand or embracing them for at least two reasons. Number one, they generally tend to be armed and carrying weapons, and I am not. Uh, I have no desire to walk into that room and simply be shot. But secondly, I want to treat them as a person. If I think of them as the enemy, as pigs, as animals, as any of those things, I'm dehumanizing them, and I'm going to relate to them as an object. I want to relate to them as people. So yes, I'll embrace them, I'll help them, I'll shake their hand, I'll sit down, I'll drink as much tea as necessary, and then when it's appropriate, we can start to talk. We have to find a way to rehumanize the people on the other side of the spectrum. Otherwise, we'll just simply end up using each other, and there's no end then to the spiral that